victory, oh victory, Jesus, my Savior, forever. He saw me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory.
eyes around I worship you I worship you You are here Bending every heart I worship Well, good morning to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, both here as well as on our live stream as we continue our series of The Resurrection Changes Everything. I want to encourage you to grab your Bibles. Let's go to John chapter 21. Uh, just kind of a, a little heads up. or, or So we're going to spend the next three weeks really looking at this text. And we've entitled it Peter's Story. We want to understand what was going on in this moment. And I just want to ask you a question. Have you ever felt like you have failed so badly that God could never love you? Or like the people around you would never trust you? Have you ever made a mistake and longed for a new beginning? Well, that's what we're going to see today. Uh, the one big thing for this morning is, is this, that Jesus' resurrection reminds us of who he is and what he offers. Let's look at it. John chapter 21, beginning in verse 1, it says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. They were together, uh, Simon, Peter, and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, 
but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore the disciples uh, whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. The Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them, and fish likewise. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to study your word together. And Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom to understand not only what was happening in the text, but Lord, what you're trying to teach us. So Father, we humbly ask that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive the truth of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus' resurrection reminds us of who he is and what he offers. So what we see here in the beginning, these first 13 verses of this text, is that Jesus takes Peter back to the beginning. If you were to overlay this text in John 21 with the uh, text in Luke 5, you're going to see a lot of similarities. Luke 5 or even Matthew 4, it's uh, when Jesus meets Peter essentially and calls him to be a disciple. Again, it was there at the Sea of Galilee, uh, though the, the John 21 text says the Sea of Tiberias, it's the same uh, place. They had been fishing all night, they had caught nothing. Jesus gets in the boat, tells, uh, tells them to go out, put, cast the net over to the other side, and again they get this miraculous catch of fish. And so there are a lot of similarities between Luke 5 and John 21. So why is it that Jesus takes Peter back to the beginning? Why do we see kind of this new beginning, so to speak? Well, Peter, uh, Jesus does this to remind Peter of who Jesus is. Jesus is the one who pursues us. There in verses 4 and 5. So they've already seen Jesus uh, in the resurrection. Later in the text it says this is the third time he showed himself. So they've already seen Jesus. So they know that he has been resurrected. But notice Peter and a total of seven disciples. They go back to, to fishing. And yet we see Jesus pursuing them. He comes to them there in verses 4 and 5. Jesus came looking for the disciples. Just like he came in Luke 5. Remember, in Luke 5 when we first meet them, they're, they're kind of the religious outcasts. They're the B team. Okay, the, the religious leaders didn't see anything in them. And yet Jesus goes and calls them to, to follow him. And now, uh, again, now it's not, the, uh, it's not other people saying that they're not any good. It's they don't believe that they're any good. Okay? They have decided, listen, we, I blew my chance, right? So I'm going to go back to my old uh, life there. But what we see is that Jesus continues to pursue them. He first called them. It's not that they came looking him and what this reminds you and I of is this that Jesus pursues us it's not that we would come after him but it's rather that he has come after us John chapter 15 verse 16 Jesus says you did not choose me but I chose you and I appointed you that you would go and bear fruit 
that would last. There in Romans chapter 3, it says, There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who seeks after God. There's none who understands. They've all together become unprofitable. They've gone their own way. There's none righteous, no, not one. And so while the, the thought for many is, well, I'm not going to push my kids you know, to believe what I believe. I'm just going to let them uh, figure it out for themselves. Listen to me. That is the most hateful thing you can possibly do. Because we are sinners by birth and by choice, we would never pursue Jesus on our own. It's why Jesus pursues us. He is the God who pursues. Jesus is also all-knowing. I love it when Jesus asks a question. He's not asking because he doesn't know the answer. He's actually kind of doing the opposite. He's alerting them to, hey, I already know this. It's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, we come home. Uh, maybe Diane and I have gone out on a, a, a date. And we come home and, and there's this big mess you know, in the living room, we get the, the kids together, and we go, okay, who did it? Now, here's the thing. We're not asking because we don't know who did it. We weren't there. It wasn't us. It was them. But this is um, kind of us giving them the opportunity to, hey, be truthful here, okay? And so Jesus is asking this question because he's about to use a physical miracle to teach some spiritual truths. See, Jesus had predicted Peter's denials. If you went back into Luke chapter 22, Jesus had said, after you turn back, strengthen your brothers. Now, Peter's going, I would never deny you, Lord. I'll go to prison for you. I will die for you. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, I'm going to tell you, before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me. See, Jesus knew Peter better than Peter knew himself. And the same is true for you and I. We always like to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. We always believe the best about ourselves. We always say, well, I've got the, the best of intentions, right? See, this is why we need to understand who we really are. In a world that says, well, they have a good heart, or just go with your heart, trust your gut. You know, the scripture says the exact opposite. In Jeremiah 17, it says, The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? See, Jesus is asking a question because there needed to be truth between them. And what we're going to see later on, probably next week, is that Peter would finally be broken. And he would finally be honest. He, he would come clean. You and I have to understand this this morning. On our own, we will lie to ourselves. We will convince ourselves of things that are not true to, to make ourselves feel better. You know, sometimes we, we start to hear what it means to follow Jesus. And somebody goes, well, you know, uh, are you really a Christian? And we start to have those doubts creep in our mind. And, and so what we do is we start listing off all the things that we do. Because we want to convince ourselves of something we're not really even sure of. Jesus is all-knowing. There's nothing that escapes the mind and the eyes of God. There's nothing that God doesn't know. But let that encourage you, okay? Be because of, of this, God's will for Peter had already factored in Peter's denials of Jesus. Jesus knew it was coming. He told him it was coming. And so let that encourage you because Jesus knows the decisions and the sins that we're going to make, and yet in his perfect will, he has already accounted for it. Now, it doesn't excuse it, but it does mean this. 
that my actions will not change or deter the will of God. Not only is he all-knowing, but he's all-powerful. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he showed his power over nature, over disease, and over demons. By his resurrection, Jesus showed that he has power over death. That's why he said to Martha at the death of her brother, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus has power over life? And death, that he is the sovereign God, that everything is in his control. These experienced fishermen toiled all night and they caught nothing. Now they probably went back fishing because that was the most comfortable thing for them. We love the familiar, don't we? We don't like stepping out of the boat into the water. Because that stepping out into the unknown, that's like, I don't know if I can do that, right? We like to go back to the familiar. But what we see here is that even the familiar fails us. Jesus is the one that gives them this miraculous catch. This this should have reminded them what Jesus said in John 15 verse 5. For without me you can do nothing. They had worked in their own effort In their own wisdom, in their own familiarity, they had worked all night, all night, and caught nothing. But at the presence of Jesus and through the power of Jesus, they were able to get far more than they would have ever done on their own. You know, I love what it says there about the nets not breaking. See, that shows us that not only does Jesus have the power to draw somebody and and save them, but he also has the power to secure us in his hand. Listen, here was the picture that Jesus was showing Peter. Peter, who has written himself off after failing Jesus, and Jesus goes, you know what, all those fish that you just caught, did you notice that not one of them was lost? Did you notice that the net never broke? You want to know why, Peter? Because I made sure it didn't. And just like you kept all those fish in the net, guess what, Peter? You're still my sheep. You're still my son and my child, and I haven't lost you. Isn't that beautiful? The God, the, those that God saves, he is secured. Jesus in his prayer in John 17 says, all those that you have given me, Father, I have kept them. And I have not lost one of them except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. In John 10, Jesus says that no one can snatch them out of my hand. And my Father who is greater uh, than all, no one is able to snatch them out of his hand so listen child of God this morning maybe you have failed Jesus through willful deliberate sin and and Satan is telling you you're no good God can't love you it's over just go on do something else understand this that the one that Jesus has saved he has secured that you cannot lose that gift that God has given you He is all-powerful. He is Savior. There in verse 6. It says, they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. That phrase, the the drawing of the nets, it's the same word in, in the Greek that Jesus uses in John 6, verse 44, when he says, no man can come to me Unless the Father which sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. See, just as God had given them the miraculous catch of fish, it is God who draws people. It is God who saves them. It is God who secures them. Our responsibility is to simply be faithful enough to cast out the net. That is to share the gospel. 
that just as sure as when you throw the net out at Jesus' direction and draw it in, it's going to have fish. Jesus is saying as you cast out the net of the gospel and you pull it in, he's going to draw, convict, and save sinners. This is the greatest truth that you and I can ever have, especially when it comes to evangelism. Because there's a lot of times that we share the gospel and, and nobody responds. It's just like a run into a brick wall. What gives us the courage and the ability to persevere through all the rejections? The promise that God has given us that he will save some. So maybe it was a shut door here. But I can go to the next one. And maybe God's already been drawing that one. And he's going to save them. It is God who does the work. Because salvation is God's plan accomplished by God's means. Jesus is also gracious and merciful. Jesus' willingness to take Peter back to the beginning shows that God gives second chances. Peter's walked with Jesus for three, three and a half years. And in one moment, one night, he seemingly blows it all. He He's cast himself off. Peter said, well, it's over. And yet Jesus meets Peter where he is. And he gives him the same command that he gave him in the beginning. Follow me. You cannot out the grace of God. I don't know what you've done. I don't know what you're doing right now, but this I do know. That if God is convicting you, if he is drawing you, if he's opening your heart to the truth of the gospel, then it means this, you have not gone beyond his grace. Where sin did abound, grace did abound much We cannot sin so egregiously that God's grace will not save us completely. Peter may have felt useless, but Jesus was going to use this to reveal his love, his grace, and his mercy through forgiving Peter and through restoring Peter. See, it's when you and I get to our lowest point that God's grace shines the brightest. It's when we get to the end of ourselves and the end of our rope and we don't know where we're going to go. We don't know what we're going to do next that we see the power and the beauty and the grace of God. See, we got to get, like Peter, we got to get to the end of ourselves. We got to understand that because Jesus rose from the dead, then all authority is given to him in heaven and earth. And that means this, that he will show mercy to who he will show mercy to, and he will save those that he desires to. That there's nothing impossible for our God because he is sovereign, he is gracious and merciful. But Jesus takes Peter back to the beginning to remind him of the call on his life. Jesus' first call to Peter was, follow me. If you see in verse 19, it's exactly what Jesus says. He looks at Peter and says, follow me. Just as I invited you in in the beginning, Peter, I'm going to invite you to begin walking with me again. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 19, I will make you a fisher of men. Now, Peter wanted to go back to his former profession, but Jesus had saved him for a higher purpose, and that purpose had not changed. Yes, Peter had sinned. He had done exactly what he said he would never do, but God already knew he was going to do it, and God already had a plan on how to work it out for his glory and for Peter's good. And the same is true for you, and it's true for me. See, Peter had been saved to glorify God. We see it in, in verse 19 that Peter's death is, it was how he was going to glorify God. See, Jesus doesn't simply save us so that we can go to heaven when we die. He saves us so that we glorify him with our life and by pointing others to people. Jesus doesn't come and save the good people. He saves the sinners. 
to show how glorious and gracious He is. You have been saved for a purpose. Ephesians 2 says, For by grace are you been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created under Christ Jesus, under good works, which he has before ordained that we should walk in them. You are saved by grace through faith so that you can do the good works that he saved you and equipped you to do. See, what Peter was going to learn was the depth of God's love so that he could go out and show others that same love. God in his sovereignty and his will was taking what Peter thought was his disqualifying moment and God was going to use it to teach Peter so that Peter could teach others about the truth of the gospel. Listen, Jesus didn't just save you so that you could wait to go to heaven. If that was the case, the moment you had received Jesus, he ought to just call you home. But rather, he has left us here for a purpose. To glorify him by pointing others to him. You have been saved and you have a testimony. And God puts you in front of people to share that testimony of who Jesus is. I was lost, dead in my sin, but Jesus died in my place, rose from the dead. And because he has called me and saved me, I have been found and I am alive. And he wants to offer the same thing to you. So the the application is to trust Jesus. We have to rightly think about who Jesus is. We have to understand that we are sinners and on our own we are hopeless and helpless. We cannot save ourselves. But because of who he is and because of the Father's plan, Jesus came in the fullness of time, died on that cross, three days later rose from the dead, not only to forgive us, to save us, to transform us, And to use us for his glory and for the building up of his kingdom. But this is the thing. You have got to stop trusting yourself. you got to stop trusting in the familiar. And you have to start following Jesus. What is the evidence that I have been saved? It is not simply my words that I am a Christian or that I believe in the gospel. The evidence of my salvation is that I am following Jesus in obedience. The first step, uh, evidence of your belief in Jesus, uh, his death and resurrection, is this, that you will be baptized. It is an oxymoron to say that I am a Christian who has not been baptized. You are not following Jesus if we haven't started there. And so I want to call you that if you have never followed in believer's baptism, now's the time. Following Jesus means to love him supremely. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. It is to love others as Christ loves you. And it is to go make disciples. The evidence that you have trusted is that you are following. And so I just want to ask you a question right now. Is it evident that you have trusted in Jesus by how you're following Jesus? If not, his invitation to you is what he said to Peter. Follow me. For some, that means you're going to have to surrender your heart and your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ today. You're going to have to confess that you are a sinner who is not saved, but believing that Jesus has died and rose from the dead to save you from your sins. You'll have to bow to the Lordship of Jesus today. The good news is, he won't turn you away. He says, as many as come to me, I will not turn them away. But you got to come. 
For some, you need to follow in believer's baptism. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to, to respond. Uh, here in, in, the, in the room, I want you to come and let's pray together. And we're going to set up a time to talk about why baptism is important. And we're going to schedule a time for your baptism. And this is what I want to say to you, for those of you watching on live stream right now. If you have trusted in Jesus, but you have never followed through in baptism, I want to encourage you, email me today, please. Pastor Justin at westlakebaptist.org. I want to talk to you about why baptism is important, and I want to find a time and a way that we can baptize you so that you can truly show that you are following Jesus. For others of you in here, you've been baptized, but you're not seeking to make disciples. It's time to confess it, and it's time to begin making disciples. If you want to know what that means, please, again, reach out. I'd love to talk to you about it. I promise you it's not as hard as you think it is. But let's no longer settle for, well, of course I'm a Christian. I, I believe in this. And let's ask this question. Can others see that I am trusting in Jesus because they see that I am following Jesus? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your grace and your word. Lord God, I just pray, as you have spoken today, Lord, would you help us to respond to that soul that is the furthest from you. Father, as you have convicted, as you are drawing them in, Lord God, would they surrender to your grace today that they might be saved. To that person that has never followed through in baptism, Father, I pray that today they will say, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to be baptized. For those that aren't being intentional of making disciples, Father, convict them of that. Help them to reach out to learn how to make disciples. And the Lord God, let us be obedient. Father, if there's any sin in our life that is keeping us from following you, I pray that we would confess it before you now and that we'll praise you for who you are and what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen.